word is saying to the church in Jesus' name. And everybody shouts. Let's open our Bibles tonight for just a while to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. And then we're celebrating the uh, <clears throat> triumphant entrance of Christ into Jerusalem. And we don't really have a lot of time to talk about the prophetic fulfilling what exactly happened prophetically on that day. You'll notice something about Christ throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was constantly saying, and this was done that it might be fulfilled that was written. You know, the, the, the Bible is a, is, is a prophetic book. The, the Bible, actually, if you could really get a hold of this. See, man was made of dirt, and we're just going to flow with whatever God quickens to my heart tonight. And, and there's some basic elementary things that if you could grasp, grab it and, and, and really believe it, it would transform your life. It would change you. You know, that's what the scripture says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, the Lord wants you to succeed. The Lord wants you to prosper. The Lord wants you to have success. The Lord wants you to accomplish whatever it is he's called you to do. But in order for that to happen, there are certain things you must do. See, we've got to cooperate with God. We've got to come into agreement with God. And in the Gospel of John chapter 17, which this is amazing, you ought to meditate. I began to memorize John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 because them are some of the most profound words that was ever spoken since the, the, the creation of man as Christ is revealing his heart to those who are his friends. And he said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends because you do what I say. For in other words, they had a faith because without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, it takes faith to seek God. It takes faith. We're talking about it this morning in Psalms 24. It says lift up your eyes, lift up, you know, lift up and the king of glory will come in. So you got to lift up your eyes. you got to get your eyes on Jesus Christ. That's really what Christianity is. It, it, it says, uh, uh, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we, say now. We are talking about that this morning. I really believe that we are living in the now time. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now I am healed. Now my needs are met. Now Christ lives in my heart. Now is the day of salvation. So right now, see right now I'm going after God. Right now I'm pursuing the Lord. Right now I'm going to walk in his will. See, you got to do what Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press, I press, I press. See, it's all a matter of your heart. What are you going to do with your life? And it's not really your life because we were singing, Lord, prepare me. My body is your temple. You bought it with your blood, Jesus. Amen. Now, he bought me with his blood. Now, this this book is literally a bag of seeds. You can go to the local farm store, you can pick up a bag of seeds, and those seeds will absolutely do nothing. They're dead seeds until you plant them into good soil, you water them, and they get the necessary heat of the sun in order for them to begin to produce, to bring forth life. This seed, see, that's why man was made from the dirt, we were made from the soil because that was a typology of our hearts. Until you get this word planted in your heart, not in your head, but in your heart, it'll never produce. 
But once you get the word planted into your heart, once it's alive in your heart, and what is the word that's alive in your heart? It's when the word of God becomes more real to you than your circumstances. That's what faith is. Faith is when God quickens, and that's what a seed does. We're coming into the springtime. I don't know why. I've just had this. You know, I've always liked the winter to some extent. I grew up in Wisconsin. I lived in Alaska, and I used to play in the snow all the time. I don't know. I just don't want to play in the snow no more. I don't know. I just don't like winter anymore. I, I want the spring. I want summer. I, I want. I want to see the, the the trees begin to blossom. I I want to begin to see the bees flirting from flower to flower. How about you? I, I just want to. I just want to run through the fields with no socks on between my toes. I want spring. Because that's where life comes forth. You know what? I think this is really the Spirit of God doing this to me. I want to see a, an awakening. I, I want to see people healed, delivered, set free. I want to see people full of love, full of compassion, full of hunger, full of thirst, full of God. I just don't, wouldn't you want to be a part of a church that's just full of God? Not religion, not hypocrisy, not self-righteousness, not man's doctrines. Don't you want to just be a part of a move of God? How about you? And I don't have to be the preacher in the pulpit. That's why we have so many other speakers coming in. And I believe that God is adding more and more. And, and I just, you know, I just want to see a move of God. I don't want it to be about Mike Yeager or about Jim Humphrey or about John or Fred or Susie or Mary. I want it to be about Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen. I just want Christ to be exalted. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. So this is a bag of seed. You've got to get this in your heart. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And you will succeed to the extent that the word of God is alive in your heart and to the extent that you surrender and submit to it. And so every scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may per be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Amen. See, I've got to bring every thought subject to the authority of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know why. I've always been that way since I've been saved. I hear preachers preach, and I tell you what, the more scripture that they speak according in, in context, the happier I get. You know, you know what I'm saying? Come on. Ladies, when you go to a dress store, you want to see dresses, right? What if there is no dresses? Well, you'd be kind of disappointed. You'd say, let's go to a store where there's dresses. Amen? I mean, if a man's going to go and they want to they wanna go to a sports store, they want to see fishing poles or guns, or they want to see, they want to see, you know, hunting stuff, right? You ain't going to find it in a dress store, are you, gonna, Brother Humphrey? You ain't going to go to a dress store and see hunting stuff. Well, you know what? When people come to the house of God, they ought to see Jesus. They ought to see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I mean, he ought to be there. And we're preparing. A man said to me this week, a minister, two ministers came by and stopped and seen me. And this man was almost shook up. He said, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, I got to tell you something. The Lord told me. He said, you're supposed to prepare a nest for the dove to rest in. A resting place for the dove. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. Where the Holy Ghost can come and abide. Where, where God feels welcome. I really don't think God feels welcome in a lot, of, a lot of churches. I don't think God even feels welcome. I really, I really wonder. Stop and think about this. If Jesus was really to show up at most people's doors who call themselves Christians. And all of a sudden you looked out the window. You said, oh, oh, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. What? Turn, our, turn off the TV. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. He went. And he'd come in. Have you ever had somebody come in your heart, in, in your in your heart, in your house, and and you, or, or you went to somebody's house, and you could really kind of just feel they don't want me here. Yeah. You can feel it, and that's okay. It's their house, right? It's their house. I mean, I mean, I don't want to invade somebody's privacy if they don't want me to. Hello. But I wonder how Jesus feels a lot of times. He says, Lord, we really want you in the house, but Lord, I can give you five minutes on Sunday morning. I'll give you a little bit of time Sunday night. No, they, you know what? Even pastors don't want to give God time on Sunday nights anymore. They don't want to give God time. So you got you to gotta give time to God. Whew. Anyway, so the word of God is very prophetic. There's a lot of prophetic things. In chapter 21, it's a very historical moment. You know, like in our culture, in our nation, we have historical moments. You know, like July the 4th or 9th. 
9-11, some of them, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, uh, different celebrations, you know. But this is very significant because there are so many scriptures in Zechariah chapter 9 and, and, and Psalms 24 and Isaiah chapter 64 that talked about this time when the king of glory, the king of kings, was going to come riding into Jerusalem on the back of a colt, a, 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 a young, a young, a young one of a, of a, of a jackass. He was going to come with humility and brokenness because it's symbolic that even though God is God, he's still meek. How can this be? God who said, let there be, and there was. God whom the very heavens would flee before his presence if he didn't make them stay in place. God who holds all the oceans in the palm of his hands, and yet he's meek and he's lowly and he's humble, he's love, and he's kind, and he's patient, and he's long-suffering. What, what do you think long-suffering means, Pastor Mike? He puts up with us for a long time, even though it causes him pain. Isn't God amazing? I'm telling you, man, I'm a, preaching myself happy already. I'm telling you, God is amazing. We are in a prophetic time. I really believe that now, I really believe in my heart, that something is about to happen in the church. We know things are happening in the world. We know that the world's falling apart. We know they're trying to hold it together with chewing, chewing gum and bailing wire. We know they're trying to just manipulate the system. They're trying to, you know, they're just trying to keep things together. And if you don't know that, you're blind. I mean, this whole, this whole, I call it kit and caboodle in Wisconsin. We say kit and caboodle is about to fall to pieces. But the Bible says that in the book of Hebrews, it says in chapter 12, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You know, you wonder why your life is being shook. It's because whatever's not built on Christ is going to fall to pieces. And if your life is not built on Jesus, if your life is not built on loving God, obeying God, following God, doing the will of God, if you do not recognize that you're a stranger in the pilgrim, if you don't recognize that you're just passing through this land... You're, you're going to be a mess. If you're always trying to find happiness, you're always trying to find a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I, I hear people, oh, man, my, 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 my pot of gold is coming. My, my chance is coming. My prosperity is coming. My, I've already got mine. I found him. His name is Jesus. I already found. I already found my prosperity. I already found my answer. I already found my solution. I already found my antidote. I already found the one who is the pearl of great price, who is the prince of peace, the king of kings, and the lord of lords, the lily of the valley, the fairest of 10,000, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the anchor of my soul in the sea of trouble, the, the ultimate answer. I found him. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Aren't you happy in Christ? Take a look what it says here in chapter 21. I don't know how far we'll get. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to this town, unto the Mount of Olives, then said Jesus, sent Jesus to disciples. Now we could work our way through this particular set of scriptures and we could discover a lot of spiritual truths. He sent his two disciples. And actually in the, in the gospel of Luke chapter 19, it says he commanded his disciples. You know what? You can command disciples. Christ can speak to, you know whose disciples are? He says, who's my mother, my brother, my sister, but they that do the will of my Father in heaven. A lot of people think they're the children of God, but they're not. They're the children of the devil. He said, if you are my children, you would hear my voice and obey me. Yes. Pastor Mike, that puts a little bit of fear in me. Good, just repent and become his child. Begin to do what he tells you to do. He said, go to this place. Go into this village over against you, and straight away you shall find an ass tied in a coat with her. Loose them and bring them on to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send them. So I want you to know God knows everything, and Christ was God in the earth, God in the flesh. Christ knows everything. You know, that's what the word of knowledge is. It, it, listen, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. Do you know all the gifts of the Spirit? There's actually 20 ways, and I, I really need to teach this. There's 20 ways that God will lead you and guide you supernaturally. And, and, and when you're in tune with God, you'll be able to see things and know things that nobody in the flesh would. Jesus looked at people, and he knew their hearts. 
Now, just because you know something doesn't mean you open your mouth and you blab it. There's times when God showed me stuff, and I stood up and preached it, and, 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 and people got offended, and people left, and, and after the service, I would be whining and crying and say, Oh, God, you gave me that revelation, and I shared it, and everybody ran out the door. He said, I didn't tell you to, to tell that revelation. I didn't tell you. He said, and then he brought me to where Paul said, I wanted to give you meat, but whereas there's envy and strife among you, you're not ready. For in other words, a wise man holds it until afterwards, but a fool utters all of his mind. So sometimes God will tell you things you're not supposed to tell anybody. Amen. There's things that God will show you you're not supposed to show anybody. Amen. And the Lord said to me, he said, if I'm going to tell you secrets, son, you better learn how to keep it. How I many you know that you don't like to share secrets with people that have big mouths? Amen. Now, it's good to have a big mouth for Jesus, but you only better say it when he says it. There's things that God will show you. He doesn't want you to write about it or talk about it or share it with anybody because it's for you and him. And it's never contrary to the book. So he tells his disciples to go and... All this was done, verse 4, all of this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, and this is Zechariah 9, verse 9, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the fowl of an ass. What did you hear preachers so and so just pulled into town with a Rolls Royce? I'm not going to hear them. He just flew in on, a, on his own personal private jet that cost him $3 million. I'm not going to listen to him. You all go listen to him. Did you hear a prophet came into town? He was just driving a regular vehicle, wearing regular clothes, not wearing any Rolex watch. Where is he at? I'm going to go hear this guy. He must have the heart of God. Oh, come on, Pastor. No true prophet ever lived like a king. Come on, John the Baptist, come on. Camel's hair, eating locusts, honey, living in a desert. That's the guy I want to go hear. I'm going to go hear an Elijah, an Elijah. I'm, I'm going to go hear, I want to go, I want to go hear somebody. Pastor Mike, don't you believe in prosperity? Well, my opinion of what prosperity is is maybe different than your opinion of prosperity. <laughs> to me, prosperity is being smack dab in the middle of the will of God, winning souls, yes. casting, feeding the orphans and the widows, Amen. being content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's why I, I just want people who are down to earth. You know, Jesus was a hero of the poor people. The rich people didn't like Jesus. Matter of fact, they mocked him. I'm not saying it's wrong to have wealth. Matter of fact, Paul said, if there's any among you that has wealth, let them be rich in good works. You better use your wealth to take care of needy people, not living high in the hog off the people. But that's between them and God. So he rides this donkey, this colt of an ass. No man had ever sat upon him before, and that means... There's something about Christ that would even calm, like, what do you mean, a, the coat of an ass? Well, listen, how many ever, you, you don't want a horse, when, when the horse gives birth and that horse begins to grow, that coat begins to grow, you know what, you got to break that, that coat. When you get on the back of that coat, he'll buck you, he'll try to get you off, you got you to gotta break that coat. Well, this, this coat, Jesus sat on it, and he just, it didn't buck, it didn't bolt, it didn't. Jesus is looking for coats like that. You think Jesus is going to rot on your back with you kicking and fussing and arguing and fighting him every inch of the way? Forget it. He's going to jump off of you. And he said, I can't ride that coat, that jackass of a coat. I'm not swearing. I can't ride that jackass of a coat. Because every time I tell them to do something, they argue with me. Every time I tell them to go somewhere, they won't listen. But did you notice his disciples listened? They went, they obeyed what he commanded them to do. They just did it. That's, that's a disciple. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Well, let me just give you my opinion, Lord. He don't need your opinion. 
Well, let me tell you what I think. I don't want to hear what you think. I tell people opinions are like noses. People put them where they don't belong. You know, I, I, and Brother Jim, you can relate with this. I mean, I'm not, I don't know it all. I, I have so far to go, it's just insane. I got to use binoculars, spiritual binoculars, to see where I need to get to yet. But a uh, telescope, you know. But I've been pastoring since 1977. You can't believe people have been, never pastored their church, maybe been, say, five, six years. Let me tell you what God just told me to tell you, Pastor Mike. And then, okay, I'm teachable, but you don't want to hurt people's feelings, hurt them little tootsies. Come on, most times people don't have an idea what they're talking about. You know, can't even run their own lives right, let alone trying to run everybody else's lives. I really do try to keep my opinions to myself. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I mean, and I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you personally, I do not know anybody in the natural. And those, they're out there. They, those people have memorized the whole New Testament, the whole Bible. I do not know anybody personally that knows more of the word of God than I do. But I don't go around telling people what I think. If they ask me, I'll say, a lot of times when people ask me, Pastor Mike, what do you think I should do? I'll just say, well, just pray and seek the face of God. Don't I, Nancy? I don't give you all kind of, well, okay, Nancy, let me just sit down and let's go over all of your history and find out what's going on. And I'm going to tell you what I think you ought to do. I don't do it. Because he says, my sheep hear my voice. I want you to hear from God. Because when the times get bad, when the times get tough, when the times get rough, and it's going to, you can't say, well, Pastor Mike said. Who cares what Pastor Mike said? Pastor Mike. Who cares? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Uh, Brother Humphrey, the, uh, the Spirit of God wants to tell you something. Listen to me. The Spirit of God will tell you, I never changed my mind, Jim. What I told you all those years ago. I meant it, and I still meant it. I never changed my mind. My hand on your life and my call and my purpose and my plan is still the same. <laughs> He's never changed his mind about you. He's got a plan for you. Man, huh? Thought the Holy Ghost in that, whether he accepts it or not. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and he brought the ass in the coat. They brought the ass in the coat and put on them their clothes, and they set him there on. Well, now that's amazing because Jesus, I mean, why would they? He could pray in the water or turn to wine. He could pray and there'd be gold in the fish's mouth. He could pray. And, and matter of fact, he didn't even tell them to put their clothes on that coat. They did it. See, I, I'm going to show you tonight. I hope we get a chance. We are coming into a move of the spirit where preachers, true godly men, will spend no time receiving offerings. They, people will just be moved by God and they'll do it themselves. They'll just start doing it. See, I, I, when I start giving to God, I, I've never been a tither. What do I mean by that? I never believed in just giving God only 10%. When the minute I accepted Christ, I believed everything I had was his. Everything I had. And you can ask my wife, and so I, whatever's mine, and I guarantee he gets way more than 10%, because he's worthy of it. You put your life and your money, what you, what you love. That's where you pour yourself into. So I'm telling you, we are going to come into a time where people really are going, we're going to have an awakening of love, true love, not this flaky, God accepts everything you kind of do kind of love, but this love that is just in our hurry, just in our hurry to go after God. I mean, we're talking about real Christianity. We're talking about a love that says, oh, God, and, and a love that says, I, I want to I live for you. I'm going to follow you. I want to obey you. I want to die for you. I want to give you every part of my being, every ounce every breath every cell of my body is yours lord that's how much i love you i just want to go all the way 
I believe we're coming into that kind of an awakening. And this, we're going to see a move of the spirit. Now, this is not psychology. This is not philosophy. This is not theology. This is a move of the spirit. So Jesus, all he did, the spirit of God is going to begin to show up right now in this place. I mean, God is just going to show up right now in this historical moment of Christ coming into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a coat because it was prophetically declared. And we are coming into a fulfilling of the prophetic awakening to where it says the Lord of the harvest is waiting into the early and latter rain be poured out. We're coming into a time of the pouring out of the early and the latter rain together. <laughs> Ooh. Man, I'm going to do one of those hectares here. Hallelujah. That's what the Jewish men do down at the will and law. Did you know that? I know where you got that from. Because God is about to move. He's about to show up suddenly when you don't even expect it. And it would not be a work of the mind or the flesh of the intellect. It won't be a work of programs. It won't be the work of a well-known preacher. It will be God. And everybody will say, that is God. That. And nobody will be able to write a book about it and say, yeah. Well, let me tell you how you can fill your church in 20 days. <laughs> Won't be no step one, step two, step three, none of this stuff. God's just going to do it. How do you know that, Pastor Mike? Because that's how God showed up in my life. Just suddenly, God, I don't know why God. Paul said that God from my mother's womb chose me to be an apostle. I didn't choose myself. I was committing suicide on my 19th birthday, full of self-pity, speech impediment, lung problems. Had the knife to my wrist, going to slice my wrist when, the, when God stepped into that little, what we call a head in the Navy, the bathroom. And I knew that I knew that I knew I was going to hell. And I fell on my knees and cried out to Jesus. <laughs> and he rescued me called me to preach. I didn't even know what a preacher was. I knew what a priest was. I knew what a nun was, a pope and a bishop. <laughs> but I didn't know what a preacher was. But he called me to preach. I believe he's been preparing me all of these years. Brother Jim got born again right around the same time. Isn't that something? We, there are a lot of us got saved in the 70s, early 70s, mid 70s. Now a lot of people got saved other times, but God has been preparing us all of these years because something's about to happen, and you can be a part of it. So they put their clothes on the back of this donkey. Nobody told them to do it. Verse 8, now listen, it really gets it. Listen, this, and a great, very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Who told them to do that? Boom, suddenly, there's masses of people. I mean, here Jesus is. He just noticed how it happened. He gave a simple commandment to two men. Go, get me the coat of this ass. Bring it to me. They went, brought the coat. The coat comes. Something happens in the hearts of the disciples. We got to cover that coat with our clothes. See, the Spirit of God is beginning to move. You know, clothes were, you know, today we got so many clothes. This is insane because of equipment. You know, the machines they've got to make clothes is incredible. You know what I mean? But let me tell you, in them days, a coat was considered very valuable, very expensive and that's why if you had two coats you were considered wealthy i know we don't understand it in america when i was in the philippines out in the bush if you had a beat up old motorcycle in the in most villages i went to you were considered wealthy we we we, we have so much wealth in america we just man we just don't understand you know how much money people blow waste you know how much money men waste on foolish stuff you know how much money women waste on foolish stuff? We're just wasteful instead of using it to reach souls. But anyway, so they took their cloaks, put them on the back of this donkey. They picked Jesus up. Now, remember, he's not saying a word. God is doing this. Say, God is doing this. See, they can't say, yeah, Jesus told everybody to put their most expensive clothes on the back of the donkey, and then he made them pick them up and put them there. No, he didn't. 
He just gave them commandment. They come back, and now God, because of that act of obedience, God begins to move in a very small, minor way, it would seem, and they took their clothes off. They took their coats off. They took their robes off. They threw it on the back of the donkey. They picked Jesus up. He gets up on a donkey. He's sitting there. Now he doesn't even tell them a word. The Spirit of God has taken over these people now, and now the Spirit of God is having them begin to take them towards Jerusalem. And as they're taking them towards Jerusalem, I got a bottle here, hon, thank you. But as they're taking them towards Jerusalem, all of a sudden there's a multitude of people. Whoa, did you see that? In, for a little bit, there was just a small group of disciples. The next thing, the, the, the streets are lined by masses of people. Whoa, about takes my breath away. That's how fast this thing's going to happen, people. I know you may not believe it right now. It's like when I used to be a fisherman up in Alaska, and I used to work on a gillnet boat out there in the Bering Sea, out there uh, in the, what they call the Bristol Bay area, and, 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 the, and they'd have these real big rivers. And one day you would be, you'd be in that little Yupik Indian village, and you're looking out over the river, and you're throwing your line, and you're trying to catch a fish. You can't catch nothing. And the next morning you come up, and all you can see from one side of the river is nothing but the fins of the salmon pushed in like sardines in a can. And the whole river is nothing but salmons head up, headed up back to their spawning lands. Just like that. That's why here last year, last February, when I had this amazing visitation where the heavens were open and I saw the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and I saw a harvest coming in, the Lord spoke to me and he said this. He said, son, he said, the great migration is about to come. I said, Lord, what do you mean the migration? He said, son, he said, all of his, all that I've created is just a typology of what I'm going to do in the spirit. He said, so when the geese begin to migrate or the fish begin to spawn or when, 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 when animals like the, the locusts break forth and they begin to, did you hear about those, those massive uh, clouds of locusts that just swept across Egypt and devouring everything? He said, that's all symbolic of my, the move of my spirit. He said, I'm about to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He says, and they're going to begin to come in by the masses. And they're not going to be running into the churches that are preaching an easy believism. And you can have what you want and, and go where you want and do what you want. They're going to go to places where they can just really be radical for God. Because they're going to be in love with Jesus head over heels. Just in love with him. I, I can't hardly wait for the time. Amen. I am so excited. It's coming. Tell your neighbor, it's coming. Hang on a little longer. It's coming. Y'all are going to have to get your thumb out of your mouth and get out of your diapers because you got a lot of diapers and a lot, a lot of diapers to change. So look, how I many you know whenever there's a lot of babies, there's a lot of stink? Why do we complain about the stink? But there's something wrong when you've been born again for 20 years and you're still stinking. It says, listen what it says here. Oh, my. It says, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes then went before and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They shouted. I wish we had time. You can look in Luke 19. It actually has, is more descriptive in some ways. They shouted. They were shouting. Well, Pastor Mike, we don't shout in our church. <laughs> Let me tell you, wherever Jesus is at, people shout. <laughs> You'll be shouting happy. <laughs> Woo! Hosanna! Now, listen, actually, Hosanna, and it's a very interesting word in the Greek. First thing, we, 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 that's actually where it, it, we get God save the king. That's actually where it comes, God save. Hosanna, God save. And then they changed it and said, God save the king. But really, if you'll study the context, it means God has come to save us. God has come to save us. God has come to save us. And the word save is sozo. It means to be healed or be made whole. 
This multitude of people are so excited because something's happening. That nobody's telling them to say this. Nobody's telling them to do this. Nobody's telling them to gather together in the masses. God, the Spirit of God is drawing them. Unless the Spirit draws them, they can't come. The Holy Ghost is drawing them. Fluorescent signs ain't drawing them. Advertisements in a newspaper ain't drawing them. God is drawing them. Let me ask you something. If God drawed them, what do you think happened in Azuzu Street? Brother Seymour, a one-eyed black preacher, he didn't advertise his meetings. People just began to come from around the world, all over the place. Even what happened in Brownsville back in the, in the early 90s, that was, you know, that was a move of God. God begins to draw them. God, you know, I used to complain. I was trying to get out of being in the cow field. I wanted to go into a city where I could reach souls. But God has kept me here. Why? Because God's going to draw them. God's going to bring them. God's going to hook them. God's going to. Bra Brother Jim just had a, pa uh, a pa prophet, Jim Humphrey. He just told me a tree. He said, Pastor Mike, I was fishing and there was no bait on my hook. That means you're not using nothing made of the flesh to get them to come. He said, but that hook got a hold of a big fish's mouth. He said, I pulled and I pulled. He said, I pulled this 30 foot fish up on shore Ooh, hey, that means there's some big ones coming in <laughs> not just the minnows not just the little ones but the big ones are coming in tell somebody the big ones are coming in <laughs> I don't know what that means but they're coming man <laughs> Woo, God's gonna do it the satellite ain't going to do it. All that God's going to do is because I had a vision. I literally had an open vision when I was out at a church in India. And I saw the globe of the earth. And I saw, I, it was so clear. And I saw fire spring up in Gettysburg. And I saw that fire begin to spread like this. And it began, I could, if I could draw a bit, I saw it. And before you know it, the whole earth was covered in the fire. And I knew that was the spirit. We're just a starting point. It's like. How many times does a forest fire get lit because somebody flicked a cigarette butt out there as they were driving down the road and they can't locate where the fire came from, but all they know is the whole forest was on fire. I'm telling you, it won't matter where the fire starts. <laughs> but when the fire starts... I'm talking about true Christianity. I'm talking about a love and a passion for God and for others. I'm talking about a holiness and an obedience. I'm, ta I'm talking about a fervency and a zeal. I'm talking, about a, I'm talking about just being obsessed and possessed and consumed. I'm talking about being filled and flooded and overwhelmed. I'm talking about being, being, being covered in God from head to toe. Hallelujah, I'm excited. <laughs> and it's going to happen suddenly. It could happen by this coming resurrection morning. It could happen this coming Friday. It could happen between now and then. But he's looking for people. He's looking for two disciples, three disciples, one disciple that God says, go do this, and you go do it. I, I tell you, there's been times when the Lord just told me to do one thing, and I obeyed, and I'm telling you what, I never expected the results that we got. When the Lord showed, told me, sign that contract for a half a million dollars here just, just about four or five months ago. They had no ministers, no money, no nothing. Didn't really completely understand what it was going to lead to. But now here we are reaching into probably close to 14, 15 million homes, whether you know it or not. Praise the Lord. Raquel, do you know the other day you were speaking into millions of homes, Sister Raquel, when you were preaching. Did you know that? It don't matter if anybody is here or not. When you get to heaven, people are going to walk up to you and they're going to say, oh, Sister Raquel, I heard the message that you were preaching and that Jesus is Lord. And I just want you to know what happened. I gave my heart to Christ and then I led my wife and my kids to Christ. And then it spread to my neighbors, my friends, and my relatives. And now I've got this prison ministry. Oh, Sister Raquel, thank you for that word you gave that Jesus is Lord. And you won't know that till you get to heaven because you planted seed. Are you happy yet? I can't believe it. I'm about out of time. <laughs> Don't look back there. <laughs> multitudes. A great multitude. Others cut down branches. They were shouting. They were crying. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, the son of David has come to bring healing and deliverance and freedom. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Um. If you look down a little bit further, he got here in verse 13. What is he going to do when he comes? Look, at this is what's going to happen in verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God. 
and he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers. Well, Pastor Mike, should we even be selling books in the sanctuary? Well, I, and I'm just going to be out. We moved them in here. I don't care about the money. People walk out with books all the time. But what was happening when we had them at the front door, they were just completely disappearing. I, I hate to tell you this, Christians steal. Well, well, people who say they're Christians. I mean, they're just disappearing. Whole piles of books were just gone. And I thought, well, I want to give them away, but I don't really want them just to steal them. So we stuck them in the back of the sanctuary. But what these people were doing is they were selling the doves and the lambs for probably 10, 15 times. Have you ever gone to a place where they sold, you know, you go to a place and they sell a bottle of, a, a can of soda for $1.50? And it only cost 20 cents. In other words, they were taking advantage of people. Jesus came and he kicked it over. He said, you, he said, he says, it is written, my house shall be called the house of intimacy, prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Can I tell you right now, you know this. I don't know if you know this. The modern day church, to a great extent, is a den of thieves. Just stealing people blind. I mean, they, you know what? I had a friend of mine, we'll close here. I had a friend of mine who, uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, it was Ron Morris' brother, Jim. He said he went to this meeting. So-called prophet, so so was there. He said, okay, he said, now the Lord's going to show you tonight. He's going to give you a visitation. He said, in this line, if you want an angel, see an angel, you come here. He says that if you want to see Jesus, you come here. He said, now if you want to see an angel, he said it's $10. He said, if you want to see Jesus, it's $50. I said, no way, uh-uh. He said, Mike, I'm not lying to you. I said, people didn't go, right? Because come on, people didn't go. He said, Brother Mike, he said, the lines were full of people, full of people. I mean, can you be that stupid and still breathe? Or like, I don't want to put these people down, but let me say this. They really are desperate for a touch of God. And somehow we've connected. Yes, your money is important. What you, what you love is what you pour yourself into. I understand this, but, but nowhere did Jesus ever charge for somebody to see an angel. He never charged for somebody to come and see him. I heard the other day, I didn't read the article, they said it was true, that in order to have a meeting with the president, you could have a meeting with him if you gave $500,000. Yeah, that's what he was charging, $500,000. And there was such an outcry, he stopped it. Listen, I don't have to go. I ain't going to go pay to see the president. He works for me. How many you know the president is supposed to work for us? Ain't that right? So I said, no way, Brother Ron. He said, oh, yeah. He said, and this was, was so terrible, Pastor Mike. He said, a little old lady, Pentecostal lady, was in a line to see Jesus. Got up to this brother, and I, could name, I ain't going to name his name, and said, oh, brother, I just want to see Jesus so bad. I just want to see Jesus. I just, you can. Right here he is. You can see him all you want. You can see Jesus. He's in this book. I see Jesus in this book. And she said, oh, brother, all I got. And she handed up a little bit of money. This is all I got. He said, no way, sister. He said, you, what, you I need $50. Oh, she's weeping. Oh, oh brother, I want to see Jesus. He said, get out of line, sister. And he pushed her out of the line. But can you believe that people, I mean, it's, it's a miracle somebody didn't get in the flesh and pop them in the face. You know what I mean? But you know what? We're going to see such a move of God where people are just going to see Jesus everywhere. People who aren't even looking for him. And so notice, let's finish up here, verse 14. And he said, he said, after he cleansed the temple, after he purified the temple, after he overthrew the tables, after he threw out the thieves, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Why ain't God healing people in the house of God, Pastor Mike? Because it's full of thieves. Oh, there are some people getting healed in spite of the preachers. I, um, 
there was a, a movie years ago. I didn't watch the whole thing. I probably shouldn't have watched none of it. It's, and, and you probably heard of it. Don't tell me that you watched it because I'm ashamed. It's called Leap of Faith. And I can't remember the guy's name. He played this evangelist. He'd dress all up with glitter on his white suit, you know, and he'd have a tent. And it was just all really a bunch of phony baloney. And he would pay people to fake healings. And one day he was in this meeting, this tent meeting, and this kid came up who was partially crippled. And somehow he got through because, see, what they would do is they'd line up all and they would put aside the ones who weren't really and the ones who were. And this kid came up and he somehow he got in. He said, oh, brother, pray for me. Just pray for me. I just want God to heal me so bad. And, and, and so he thought, wow, just so he prayed a simple little prayer and kind of pushed the kid off aside, the crippled lame kid. Kid kind of fell down when he pushed him out of the way because he wanted to get to the people that he had paid to say they got healed. Well, the kid got up healed started weeping he's i'm healed i'm healed it, it it just he just about lost it he said what and the guy got healed in spite of the shyster i don't know is that a bad word the bad dude the snake the thief the guy got healed i'm telling you what people are getting healed in spite of the thieves. But I tell you what, I believe we're going to come to a time if we will clean house, they will all get healed. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. They will get all healed. Now, tonight you can be healed. If you weren't here last night, Brother Ricky Leonard shared an amazing testimony. The DVD is available. You can watch it on the internet too. Rick, Ricky Leonard, just awesome. He's not about five foot seven, a little bit shorter than I am. He's been preaching for 30 years, but he used to be a, <clears throat> he, I mean, he used to uh, be pretty rough dude and and uh, gun runner and drugs and alcohol. He used to work in a, and you, you were here last night, Raquel. Wasn't that an amazing testimony? And he got in a gunfight with the police. He blew their, shot their vehicle, all the pieces turn around and try to run away. The cop shot four times, hit him in the back of the head with a, a 38 hollow point, blew part of his brain out, fell down. They said he, they, he was dead. They brought him back to life. He was crippled in the hospital, could get, barely get around, lost his eyesight, gave his heart to Christ in prison. And this uh, two brothers came to him, one Catholic who was born again and another guy and said, I had... I, I saw you getting healed if you would believe. And he says, I believe. He said, well, you're supposed to pray. So Leonard, Ricky Leonard prayed a prayer. And instantly, God completely restored him right then and there. Completely, completely restored him. Completely. And they had revival in that prison. He was supposed to be in prison for almost 30 years. And he got out within six and a half years. And he's been preaching around the world ever since. But that same Jesus that healed him is here tonight. Healing is here for you. Freedom is here for you. You know, it's really in my heart. We just all need to begin to tell people now. Right now, we're in the midst of a move of God. Right now. See, you can't stop. The Lord spoke to me. He said, don't put it into the future any longer. It's now. God is here now. We got to move with the Spirit now. Holy Spirit is touching and delivering now. Jesus is walking in our midst right now. Christ the healer, right now, I want to talk to those who are watching by TV or Internet. I want you to know right now you can accept Jesus Christ. Right now you can repent of your sins. Right now you can cry out to God and he'll heal you. And so I want those of you that are here tonight, those who are watching, I want you just to close your eyes and pray a very simple prayer with me if you'll do that right now. Just say this prayer, Heavenly Father, go ahead, y'all pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I repent of my sins. I am so sorry I have broken your heart. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he took my sins on the cross. And I repent of my sins. And I believe in my heart that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Come into my heart right now and make me a brand new person in Jesus' name. Now, if you meant that, if you were serious when you prayed that prayer, 
I want you to know that Christ came into your heart right now. Now, he's not going to take away your free will. You have a free will. You have to choose to follow God, serve God, and obey God. And you need to begin to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get Christ alive. Let him become alive in your heart. But I'm telling you that also by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. He took those stripes upon his back. They beat him to the place where he didn't even look like a man. And he took those stripes to get you healed. And so if you need healing in your body tonight, and if you're watching, if you're here, I want you to put your hand right now where that affliction is, where that pain is, that problem is. Right now, put your hand there. Maybe it's your head. Maybe it's your back. Maybe it's your stomach. Maybe you've got two or three different places. I don't know. Just put your hand all over the place. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to come against that. I'm going to take authority in the name of Jesus. And so those of you who are watching right now, oh, Michael, we're not even live streaming, are we? Are we still live streaming? Put your hand in that sickness and that illness right now, and we're going to command it to go. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that we have authority, we have power, we have dominion. I come against the cancer. I come against the tumors. I come against the ruptured disc in the back. I come against the arthritis. I come against the stomach ulcers. I come against the acid reflex. I come against, Lord, those problems where I see those eyes that are dry and they won't produce. The deer ducts aren't working. I command, I command those ears. I command all of the sickness, all of the disease, all of the afflictions, all of the works of the devil to loose you right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> right now, I release his healing virtue into your bodies and I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. Now I want you to go ahead and Move that part of your body that was hurting, that part that wasn't working. Maybe it was your back. Stand up and touch your toes. If you're here, stand up and touch your toes. Maybe you couldn't may, do something you couldn't do before. Just don't sit there like a lump of log. Do something you couldn't. Maybe hit your stomach where the pain was. I don't know. Do something. Come on, do something. Twist a little bit. Come on, do something. And begin to thank God you're healed. Amen. Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. <laughs>